Hola, hola familia cripto, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos a un nuevo video. Este video es bastante particular y especial para mí porque como verán lo hice con Jimmy Song. Jimmy Song es una de las personas más reconocidas, programadores, eh, ingenieros a nivel, eh, más reconocidas a nivel técnico en cuanto a blockchain y él enseña cómo programar sobre Bitcoin. Tuve la oportunidad de conocerlo hace un par de semanas y le pregunté si él estaba dispuesto a hacer una clase educativa conmigo para brindarles más valor a ustedes, a la comunidad latina. Sí, como verán, esta clase y en esta introducción quiero aclarar dos cositas rápido, rápido, rápido. Uno, esta clase es para avanzados, ¿sí? Tómalo como motivación, no dejes que te intimide todo lo que vamos a hablar, míralo con detalle, hacele pausa, toma nota, mira lo que pusimos en la pantalla. El, el mensaje que quiero decir es el siguiente, no lo tomes como algo que te pueda llegar a intimidar, sino como que te motive a saber de qué está hablando, por qué necesito entender esto, tanto para ustedes como para mí, ¿ok? Y número dos, les recomiendo altamente que vayan a mi canal de YouTube, ¿sí? Y vayan al video este que dice transacciones, clase 2, transacciones. En este video hago como una, como una introducción sobre las transacciones en Bitcoin, y les recomiendo también que lo vean para tener un mejor entendimiento sobre lo que vamos a hablar con Jimmy. Este es uno de los primeros videos que puse en el, en el canal, transacciones en la clase número 2, vayan a verlo para entenderlo. Y gente, con todo, espero que les guste, es un capo Jimmy y estuvo dispuesto a estar con nosotros para brindarnos valor y llevar nuestros conocimientos al próximo nivel. Espero que lo disfruten y déjenme un comentario eh, para ver qué les pareció. Gracias. Hi everybody, welcome to another video. In this one we have the honor to have a very special guest. It is someone from whom I've been learning a lot and this is for the Latino community mainly. And you guys know that I mentioned Jimmy in almost all my videos. Uh, if you want to learn uh, the technical aspects of this technology, which is some, something that we all need to do in order to have more perspective and make better decisions and make better investments from now on, we need to listen to the best tech people out there. And Jimmy is one of them, as you guys know. Jimmy, welcome. <laughs> you are just way too kind. Thank you for having me. Uh, awesome. So in this video, we are going to teach you guys uh, what a transaction is all about. We are going to take the opportunity that Jimmy is here with us to dive deeper um, into the components of the transactions. And uh, why we need to talk about transactions, Jimmy? Because I think it's the most important components in the Bitcoin ecosystem because all the other components, actually, they are to ensure that the transactions are created, that they are propagated, that they are validated, and lastly, that they are uh, recorded in the global ledger, right? Yeah, yeah, transactions are more or less the very atomic unit of Bitcoin. This is, this is what makes everything run, and, uh, and when I teach my class, I spend, uh, you know, I, I, I think I teach for something like 16 hours. Six of those hours are dedicated just to transactions because wow. it is just such an important part of, uh, of what Bitcoin is. Absolutely. And uh, okay, so we're going to start this by defining what a transaction is. Uh, so a transaction, it can be defined as a data structure that encodes, encodes uh, the transfer of value between participants when we hear people uh, saying and mentioning all these terminologies such as coins, senders, addresses, balances, there are no such as things, right? Because those are uh, terminology for the users. But now we're going to dive deeper into what a transaction, we are going to see the behind the scenes of a transaction, so to speak. So the components of the transactions, as you can see on the screen, are the version, the lock time, inputs and outputs and right now we're going to be focusing on these two okay inputs and outputs and we're going to make uh, a comparison between them both i'm going to start with the outputs as uh, jimmy suggested uh, that i that i do and the outputs all the transactions have inputs and outputs except one transaction right which is the com based transaction that is the first transaction. That, believe it or not, Coinbase transactions still have inputs. It's, it's actually okay. really kind of interesting. But yeah, they, they do have an input, but it points to a transaction that doesn't exist. It's, it's actually really kind of cool. Okay. 
uh, we can talk about that later, meaning yeah. details as well. So yeah. the transaction, the, the outputs uh, in the transaction, actually this is something that not everybody knows that I didn't know before, is that all the tra in, in one transaction, we can have many different outputs, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is something that not everybody knows, and we're going to be talking about one specific output that is very important to specify, which is the change. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. And uh, so the outputs, they create a spendable Bitcoin, which are called unspent transactions outputs, correct? And they are put, are collected in like a set. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are the two things that I wanted to mention. And the components of the outputs are the following. Number one, the amount of Bitcoin that I want to send to the other um, person. And number two, a locking script or how do you pronounce that? Script pub key? Script pub key. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I can go into much more detail on those, but... Um, can, we, can you go back to the previous slide? I just want to talk about version oh, and over time just very, very quickly because yes. um, you, know, you might, you might uh, see that and go, okay, well, why are we skipping those? And, and uh, I, I always want to make sure that uh, when I explain things, I try to be as complete as I can. Perfect. So version is supposed to be um, a way to increment. Uh, so if you think about like the version of your operating system, if you have something like Windows, you might have Windows 8, you might have Windows 10, you might have Windows 3 if you have a really old computer, I guess. Um, that's what that's supposed to be. Uh, Bitcoin has almost always used version 1 and it hasn't really incremented. The only time you can use version 2 is, w is if you use the opcode check sequence verify. That's the only only way you would have a version number other than one, and that's if you use check sequence verify in, in either the input or output script. Um, mm -hmm. And script uh, is something that Catalina just touched on just briefly with the script pub key, that's a locking script. Um, you can think of that as the smart contract language behind Bitcoin. So a lot of people think, okay, well, smart contracts are all Ethereum. It's not true. Uh, Bitcoin has smart contract it has an entire smart contract language called script and it's part of the inputs and outputs as we'll, we'll, we'll be studying. Um, and there's a lot of functionality there, though we've been going more towards restricting a lot of that, uh, that functionality because like very few people use it. 99% of the stuff out there are like very standard uh, script pub keys, for example. And those are what you see. Uh, so like, like Catalina was mentioning with respect to addresses, that's, uh, that's more for the user, right? Like uh, when we see an address that starts with a one or a three, um, that's actually a particular type of script pub key. That's, uh, that's how they can address uh, coin or assign coins to you. Uh, but it, it's really actually a whole um, particular, uh, you know, set of opcodes plus a hash or 20 byte hash that gets encoded in that address that gets transferred when, when a wallet takes a look at that address. They convert that address to a valid script pub key. And that's when you, when you pay somebody, that's what your wallet does is it takes the address from you and it converts it to a script pub key uh, that, that it can figure out just based on the address because these are so common. Excellent. Yeah, perfect that you mentioned that. Wait, let me... Oh, oh, I forgot to go to the other one, <laughs> lock time. Oh, so, lock time. Lock, yeah. yeah, yeah. So lock, lock time is interesting because uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to be kind of like a post-dated check. So you know how if you have a check, you can, um, you can write the date to be sometime in the future. So... Um, right now, I can write some uh, a check that says January 1st, 2019. And if I give it to you, then you can't cash that check until January 1st, 2019. The bank will look at the date and go, well, this isn't valid yet. And you, you have to come back on January 1st in order to um, you know, get money from us. And that's the idea of lock time is that if you, if you set a lock time and it's, uh, it's kind of tricky, but basically if it's under 500 million, then it's a block number. If it's over 500 million, then it's a Unix timestamp. But you could, you could say something like, hey, um, this transaction is only valid after January 1st, 2019. 
or this uh, transaction is valid only after block number 600,000 or something like that. Um, Satoshi put that in there, but it turns out not quite as useful the, as you might think because you could, you could give somebody a post-dated check, but, uh, but what I can do if I'm the one that wrote you that check is I can change my mind. I can actually go spend it mm. and then make that transaction invalid. So it turns out not quite to, a, as useful until we put in check lock time verify or what, uh, what people call op hodl. Uh, that's an op code that's part of the smart contract language of Bitcoin now, which makes it so that your Bitcoins are locked until a particular time, okay. which is actually more useful than giving somebody a post-dated check. So mm -hmm. a couple of uh, fields there that are very useful to know about and uh, they're part of the innovations or in, uh, and functionality that people have been putting in. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right. so, so let's go back to outputs. Yeah. Outputs. <laughs> yeah. No, everything you want to add. I think you have already covered what a lock-in strip is. Uh, it's basically a puzzle that determines the conditions required for me to spend the outputs. It's like yeah, a message, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could think of it like a lockbox, right? Like, um, so it's like a one-way lockbox. So somebody can send you money but only the person that owns that lockbox can open it and take the money and do whatever they want with it. Exactly. Um, and, and that's because uh, it's, it's actually based on ECDSA or elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, uh, which means that only the person with the private key to that public key, which hashes to the address actually, uh, they're the only ones that can spend it. And this is awesome. based on two very um, common scripts, uh, script pub keys. The ones, uh, the addresses that start with a one that's called pay to pub key hash. And then the addresses that start with a three that's called pay to script hash. Those are two forms that are very well known by wallets. And in fact, most wallets don't implement anything other than those two things, uh, right. if, if that. Uh, so it, uh, you can actually lock it to something much more complicated. It's just that no one does because mm -hmm. it turns out when people are transferring money, they just want like, uh, you know, something standard and they could have something really complicated saying like two of three of these people or some amount of time has passed and one of these people signs or, you know, seven of nine of these people, you, you, can, you can make these scripts like extremely complicated if you want. Wow. But as we've seen in Ethereum, the more complicated you may make something, uh, the more difficult uh, it is to check for security and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So people stick with the, uh, the simplest stuff and that ends up being the addresses that start with a one, a three, or if you're really advanced, the ones that start with BC1, which are SegWit um, addresses. All right. Yeah, that's why I wrote here, like the message would be send X amount of Bitcoin to whoever mm -hmm. can present the signature from the private key corresponding to a certain public key. Yeah, yeah. Or well, well, hash of that public key. That's pay to pub key hash. Um, uh -huh. it's, called, okay. it's called script pub key, by the way, because the very original one, uh, which, uh, which Satoshi did was called pay to pub key, uh, not pay to pub key hash. And, uh, and basically what, what would go in the script pub key is literally just the pub, public key of your, uh, of your private key. Um, and, and that may seem secure, but it turns out that there's a lot of drawbacks to that, which is why people started using pay to pub key hash. So a lot of like Satoshi's coins are locked in something called pay to pub key, which just literally has the pub key uh, as the script pub key in the output. Um, but later ones, and, uh, and these are the addresses that start with a one, they all are hashes of the public key. So you actually not only have to present the signature, but you also have to present the pub key that hashes to the value that's in the script pub key. So there's multiple layers of security around it. Um, also makes for a shorter uh, script pub key, which ends up being very important because of what you said. Uh, the UTXO set. Uh, and if you don't know what the UTXO set is, that's the unspent transaction outputs. Uh, these are Here. only the outputs that are unspent. So every transaction has one or more outputs um, and, uh, and whoever can unlock them can spend them. Once they're spent, they're no longer in the UTXO set. Mm -hmm. And this is to solve the uh, double spending problem. Uh, once you know that something's been spent, it's no longer in the UTXO set. You can check very quickly 
whether or not a transaction is valid by keeping that UTXO set around. Like from a programming standpoint, if you know that this output's already been spent, then you know that uh, anybody that purports to uh, spend something that's not in the UTXO set, that's automatically not a valid transaction. And that's, that's a very important um, way to speed up uh, the operation of a node is being able to look up whether or not a transaction is valid very quickly. And also, you can, uh, you, as you'll see, you need to look up the amount on the UTXO because uh, you know, the output has the amount, but the input does not. And that means that uh, if, if the input does not have the amount, you have to actually go look it up on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Now, you could like, traverse through the entire blockchain, look for that particular transaction, but almost every node software out there indexes which ones are unspent just so they can go look it up really fast. Um, and that, that makes the operation of the node from an engineering perspective mm -hmm. much, much faster. So interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I could listen to you for, I could listen to you for hours. Oh my God. Uh, my, um, my students do. I, I force them for like 16, of, uh, 16 hours. Yeah. I'm your it. next student. I told you. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I think that summarize uh, outputs. I think, well, you can talk for hours, but to make it <laughs> not that long for people to, to follow, let's go mm -hmm. to the inputs. We started with the outputs in order to specify what this was in order mm -hmm. for, to understand what inputs are all about. <laughs>